So here we go. So, well, welcome everybody uh, to our uh, conversation today uh, on Flannery O'Connor uh, and race. We, um, I'm Mark Bosco and with here with Elizabeth Coffin and our guests and friends uh, who are all kind of aficionados or have great, great love for Flannery O'Connor's work uh, and uh, for her craft and, and for her life uh, in many ways. We're here to kind of unpack some of the aspects that, that Elizabeth and I uh, tried to put together in our uh, film, Flannery O'Connor. I hope you've seen it all. We're assuming that you have, because we might be uh, uh, referring back to the film during this uh, talk back, you might call it. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to thank you for being here. Uh, it's gonna be on, it's on Facebook. So if you wanna put uh, some uh, comments down, we're very happy, please. Please be kind and, and, and do it uh, you know, uh, in a constructive way. That'll be really helpful for us. And there will be some time for questions too. So there'll be somebody monitoring the questions. So hopefully we'll have a chance uh, to uh, have your question uh, answered uh, by our distinguished uh, group of uh, panelists and friends today. So let me introduce everybody uh, first. Uh, and we're gonna start with Karen Kunrad, uh, the lovely Karen Kunrad, American theater director, teaches at Yale School of Drama, um, did these wonderful modern adaptations of classical plays, uh, is in Italy quite often with her uh, company, Compagnia de Calambari, but really has uh, done some amazing things with uh, William Shakespeare, the, the Tempest in right set in Venice, not the Tempest, the Merchant of Venice in Venice, uh, which was uh, absolutely wonderful. I know you've done the Tempest too. Um, she's been a director at the Joseph Papp Public Theater, at the New York Theater Workshop, American Rep and, and right at the Folger Theater as, as, uh, as well. Um, Karen, of course, has made this wonderful adaptation, uh, well, many actually not uh, adaptations from non-dramatic sources. So Walt Whitman's uh, Song of Myself uh, from 1855 has been put into this wonderful uh, a dramatic piece called More or Less I Am. I think it's still, I think I saw it just a week ago on Facebook or something. Um, as well as though Flannery O'Connor and uh, kind of a breakout uh, kind of moment with uh, dramatizing Flannery O'Connor's short story, Everything That Rises Must Converge. It's really a thrilling uh, uh, adaptation. So, so welcome, Karen. We're really excited that you're here. And Karen also makes a, 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 a few moments in our, our film as well, with a lot of, a lot of film afterward as well. Our second, again, Richard uh, Rodriguez. Uh, hello, Richard. We're just so glad you're with us. An award-winning writer and journalist um, whose uh, visual essays from the PBS NewsHour won him a P Peabody Award. Um, I guess I first came to know Richard through his book, um, uh, his first book, Hunger of Memory, The Education of Richard Rodriguez, published in uh, the 1980s. Um, and really his account of, of his journey being in a Spanish-speaking household, he would quote a socially disadvantaged child to kind of uh, becoming an assimilated American. Uh, uh, he's wrote another book that I actually have my students often read a chapter or two of called Brown, The Last Discovery of America, which kind of takes the color brown and its meaning for Hispanic life in America today. And his latest book, Darling, a spiritual biography, which came out, I think, around 2012, 2013, uh, and a huge Flannery O'Connor fan uh, who has spoken uh, quite eloquently about um, her and is in our film. Uh, and then we have Carl, uh, Carlton Ter Terrence Taylor, who is an actor and a member of the Compania de Colombari with Karen Kunrad. Uh, and he's performed throughout the country in this dramatic adaptation of Everything That Rises Must Converge, playing these kind of multiple roles uh, at, at times. He's also the artistic director of Impact Repertory. Did I get that right, Carlton? Impact Repertory uh, Theater, uh, teaching kids up in Harlem. So, um, and of course, I have my great colleague, Elizabeth Hoffman, who you all should know by now. Um, who has been uh, this collaborator for the last uh, eight, eight years uh, putting together this film. So welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So uh, we're gonna kind of open this up as a conversation. I'm gonna kind of uh, back off now, but I do wanna say if there was, if there's one thing you wanna say, what, what, what's provocative or what still provokes you about Flannery O'Connor, either from what you see in the film or just where you are, where you land with her, uh, what's still provocative? And, Obviously, we're trying to we're trying to approach and engage the question of Flannery O'Connor and American racism, and, Amer and Flannery O'Connor and her own sense of, of of what was going on with race in her stories. So, uh, 
at that, uh, I will leave it to somebody to go first. Uh, let me, can I just say something? I, 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 you know, as a brown man in America, I've always been interested in the black and white dialectic as both encompassing me and being irrelevant to my life because I don't know where I fit in all the time to that discussion. Nonetheless, uh, I read Flannery Cutter in high school and I remember being, I, I don't want to say shocked, but 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 uh, thrilled by the language of of, of this of, of this writer, and and particularly by the edginess of the voices she was recording. This is obviously a woman who grew up in a small Georgia town, and who was a listener, and who knew what the colloquial sound of Georgia is. It was not pleasant, but it was nonetheless thrilling to listen because it was it was always I thought of her. Is almost a dramatist. Her her descriptive passages, for example, at the end of her short stories, where the, the sun would always be setting, that was usually God was entering the picture, always silent God. He was always, the, the moon was coming down or the, the sun was going up. But what I loved about it was not God in entering, but just this flow of voices that just moved you into places that you didn't expect. Crackers, uh, racists, of school teachers, uh, parents, uh, little kids, uh, freaks of every sort. And she made you hear their voices uniquely. That was what caught me. Mm -hmm. Cool. Same thing for me when I, when I was, I read her in college, I was 19 and she just blew my head open. I just thought, because she didn't take any prisoners. You know, and and that was, she was like Dante, and I was at that point interested in Dante too, and you know, it, it was extraordinary in this American vernacular that she accomplished all that. I wasn't in the theater then, but the work, as you say, Richard, is, is inherently dramatic, um, and so I think that's another reason that I was really drawn into it. And I think that, that she is so astute as a listener and as a watcher, because colors, she was a painter too. So the, what she saw um, and her observations and her listening, extraordinary really. Yeah. Cool. I believe just how uh, vivid and human um, the characters are really just the, the detail in the description just really helps you live in a place um, where you can see the truth for what it actually is and um, find some kind of understanding and peace in it. And it's like the more you read it, um, the more these characters come out, not necessarily pointing a finger saying that this is good or bad. These are the things that exist how do we deal with them, you know? And that ability to um, kind of take you to a place um, and then allow you to have your own discovery there is just something that I just find fortunate in reading her work. And it's so interesting that um, it continually like comes up. Like, I feel like it follows me. I was watching something completely not related, a Netflix television show about um, Hannibal and one of the women is reading to a girl in the hospital, hoping that this girl will fight and push through. And who is she reading to her but Flannery O'Connor? <laughs> this was literally yesterday. Like, you know, that fighting spirit, like, you know, that, that, that no prisoners, that fire, you know, like, you know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to try to contain and understand. Wow. Well, Carlton, I love the, the take no prisoners. Uh, perspective on O'Connor because I, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, just south of Savannah and Milledgeville. So I grew up in this really segregated, I grew up in O'Connor's world and I was on the, the white side of that segregated world. And, and so when I, I was an English major in college and when I first read her, I have to say that I found Faulkner easier to take on than O'Connor. And there was something that was so um, almost an affront, it was so visceral, her dialogue and her language that honestly, it was not until uh, Mark asked me to help make this film that I came really back into her fiction and was able to throw myself into it in a different way. So 
you know, Mark, you ask about what what are provocative moments for us, and and for me, it's the displaced person. It was reading the displaced person, and then finding the uh, the PBS adaptation of it that Hilton All said changed him too. And for me, right now, reading the displaced person right now, I'm like, this is this is it. This is horizontal <laughs> violence. This is uh, I uh, regained new respect for her and was able to really. Uh, encounter her fiction in a way that I was not able to when I was in my 20s when I first read her when I pushed her aside a little. Do you like her? I, it occurred to me when I was reading recently that I'm not sure I would have liked to have met her. Uh, I love her as a writer. I would have liked to have met Regina because Regina in her daughter's description is always chattering away but a flattery strikes me as a difficult a difficult companion. Um, I just wonder whether you came to like her in, in the course of working on her. That's a great question. Uh, I came to know her, respect her, um, admire her bravery and her courage and her sense of humor, her slight arrogant, you know, I'm going to throw this back in your face <laughs> because, I, you know, of I think her own challenges. So I, I, I hope what comes out in the film is a sense of that courage and a sense of that bravery. And uh, yes, I have to say the part of me that is a Southerner that understands that kind of world a bit, um, ah, I like her. I, you know, it's funny, Richard. I think when I first read her, I was just, I was always like, what? what is all this violence? Why are all these dead bodies around at the end of these stories? And just trying to get my head around the fact that, uh, how do I understand it as a teenager reading her, that this is this is a woman with a religious vision or, or a Catholic vision for that matter. Um, but you know what, I, I have to say, I think I did fall in love with her. And I thought I could be your friend after reading The Habit of Being, because I just felt she shared so I think you said it, Carl, that there's a transparency and absolute truth to her, her sharing. Uh, uh, and sometimes it's, it's difficult, but I just, I really, it was, it was such a respectful way of being with some of these, uh, certainly Betty Hester, um, Marianne Lee, the Fitzgeralds, that I think it, had she been around, I would have liked to have met her and I would have liked to have seen if I had ever, could ever have encountered her at that level. Um, but until the habit of being, I was with you, Richard. It's like, whoa, she's demanding she'd be a hard friend to have. Well, um, her letters, I think you're exactly right. It's the letters with her friends that she shows yeah. her love and her empathy. Humanity. Yeah, but when Alice, Alice Walker remembers coming to the house, this is after she's dead, and being in a rage at how different her house is from the house that Alice Walker lived in. But it's, it's hard to know what she would have made if Alice Walker had knocked at the door and either Flannery or Regina had answered the door. It's just hard to know how generous these people were. At the same time, the, 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 southern, the southern dimension of friendship and strangers and, and what you can say and can't say is so mysterious to those of us who aren't members of the club that I, I always thought that, that, for example, you know, that, that you weren't even, a, her friend could not even say that she was dying of lupus. Uh, because it was that, that secret in the family, you know, mm -hmm. that she was that she was ill is not in any of the stories. You, you, what, what, what is in the stories is this sense of, I, I, I want to say her disgust of the human body. Uh, there, are, there, are, if she, there are no beautiful people in, in, in these stories. There are, if, if she has a young teenager come through, that teenager has bad acne or that teenager has an Adam's apple that sticks all the way to Duluth or something. Uh, there's always this sense of 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 the of of her of her displeasure with her own body becoming this vision of the wounded body that she sees all around her. That's the only clue that I have as a reader that something is is very very strange here. Yeah. And Carlton, what was it like to embody the words and the characters as an actor and a narrator? Um, it was really interesting because I feel like you 
as you begin to take on the ideas or the thoughts in the character's heads, you know, you still as a person, me as a black man, have to decide in this time, in this period, even like right now, what do I think about this? Like, you know, where's the, um, the, the, the permission that we've been given to comment on it? Because it's a fact, so you can't change it. These things have happened, but really, how do I feel being in this space? Like, how ridiculous is this? Like, you know, like, let's all like, you know, like, let's all laugh, like, you know, like at the fools, like, I don't know, like it just, it, it just, and sometimes it's playful because it's like some things are direct and some things are in your face. And then it's like, you know, well, maybe I actually have to, I have to see how I feel about it. And I've been privileged to do it, um, to do it more than, um, to do more than one version of this. So it grows and it changes. And I would like to say that the audience has a lot to do with it because me thinking about the ears that these words are falling on um, and, and thinking about the time and the place, like what would a black woman do on a bus? Like, you know, at that time with a young child when the difference, like <laughs> even now is life and death, you know? So that it's like the just looking in that direction could have meant I could have gotten off that bus and not returned and living in that reality and that fear, but still being present. Like, you know, is um it was challenging, you know, and it and it, and 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 um and it helped me work through it helped me work through a lot of my own, a lot of my own issues and um and and being powerful. Um, in the moment of saying, actually, I am a part of this. And so I get to, through her words, be present and alive and powerful. And this is where I stand. So, I mean, I hope that answers the question. I said a lot. <laughs> and well, Karen, yeah, Karen, please. Probably, yeah, I should probably jump in there because um, uh, Carlton is the lead narrator in Everything That Rises Must Converge. He also plays the little boy Carver, and um, who's four years old. And so, but as the lead narrator, he has the first text and he has the final text. He sort of is an alter ego for Julian watching him, but he, as the lead narrator of, of eight actors, they're the, the two featured characters, the protagonists of course are, are Julian and his mother, who don't know themselves. I mean, there's this existential uh, quarrel about who am I? You don't know who you are. You, I certainly do know who I am. That is you know, at the heart of literature and is tossed around in a, quite a hysterical way here. And the narrators get to mock that and show that whiteness doesn't really know itself. Mm -hmm. And that's what Flannery O'Connor was doing is taking down, um, taking down though basically the type of the Southern Belle. Uh, mostly, you know, she was, she started writing about black folks, you know, when she was at Iowa and she was told from what I remember in my reading um, that she should write what she knew. About what she know. Yeah, so she, she wrote what she knew, which was, and mostly she was taking down white women, you know, and herself, her own sex, her own race and finding, um, the hilarity of it, always finding herself in the intellectual. So Julian, so both of these characters don't know themselves. They quarrel with each other um, as is also a privilege of, uh, you know, the adolescent with the, the mother and the white in whiteness, within whiteness and all that. And, and I, in fact, when we took it to, the, um, I remember we took it to uh, DOC Manhattan to the jail and one of the, inmates, black inmate, turned to his fellow inmate and said, look how that boy's treating his mama. <laughs> 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 so I thought, you know, that that was just a response. And, and of course, that's it's 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 driving the thing and the invective at the end where he says, you don't know who you are. And so it's a constant battle, just as when in a family we have a quarrel and a feud and we want to win that argument. Um, and then it ends with suffering, which is what well, I know Thomas Merton said something about her being like Sophocles. And I think it's sort of, it's because, you know, and Carlton has that last line, it, 
about ending, you know, uh, uh, what is it, uh, with sorrow, right? Now is the beginning, basically, of a whole landscape of knowledge and so suffering and sorrow, but it's... it's His entry into the world of guilt and sorrow. That's it. Yeah. And Karen, I was lucky enough in Carlton to see your performance at the Cook County Juvenile Detention Center of Everything That Rises Must Converge. And what I thought was so important there was the discussion afterwards that the story, you know, there's the performance, which was wonderful and incredible and thought provoking. And then there was the discussion afterwards uh, with the, you know, the, the kids who were in prison and what that meant. And Karen, I wonder if you could say what, why, what were your instincts to take this story to try to get it into, into prisons? Well, why do you think that's useful? Yeah, I think the, the, the story has a kind of psychological geometry, you know, which, which can be played out um, on the stage. And so, you know, it was a test, you know, we had taken Whitman in there and that certainly worked. Um, and the way we embody it, you know, with uh, these characters, what, what, I, what I also, I, I just felt, and, and, it, and as you say, there was a response in both meetings, both times that we went into uh, jail this past fall, there was a, a, a response to it and lots of discussion. I feel that O'Connor, and this is what I do want to bring out, and I always say this to the actors, she created, she created white characters that spoke more than they knew, and she created black characters that knew more than they spoke. Interesting. And wow. so, you know, I remember one of my actors saying, oh, that helps me a lot to understand. And because the agency of the actors, as Carlton was saying, you know, how do I feel? I mean, there's one line where, do you, you remember, Carlton, you say, when he got on the bus by himself, he made a point to sit down beside a Negro. A distinguished Negro. Yeah. yeah, he made a point. So he's, he's mocking with the entire company, mocking uh, the progressive liberal in Julian, who's really a, a poser. You know, who, who one, said, one, of the, one, yeah. one of the interesting things that when you say she did, she gave voice to the white characters is that she really did figure out a way to make white voices sound. They have this, I mean, they're as vivid as anything in, the, in these stories. In some ways, the black characters, when they come on, much to the annoyance of the white characters who feel that they're being patronized by these voices, that they're not, that they're, be, that they're not being told anything. There, and when they, when the white woman seeks solace or, or consolation from a black voice, the black voice won't give it to them, except in the most patronizing ways. But it's the white voices that have all this color to them. It's all, it's a paradox that that she does that. That she, uh, it's almost unique in American literature that, that white voices that that have segregated themselves from from human experience are able to to sound more powerfully and to have color to them. Yeah. And Richard, you asked what what would Flannery have said if, um, you know, a, a black Milledgeville citizen came to her door? What would she have been able to respond? And yeah, I was just reading a letter that Flannery had written to Marriott Lee in 1957, where she's joking with Marriott Lee had been driven to the Atlanta airport. Uh, by a black fa family friend and Marriott Lee sat in the front seat, which was really taboo at that time. Marriott Lee's brother was the president of Georgia College. So Flannery was writing to Marriott and saying, listen, everybody was doing rhetorical somersaults to try to hide the fact that you rode to the airport and sat in the front seat with uh, a black driver. And Flannery wrote in that letter, she said, I'm not sure what I would have said if I had ridden in that seat. And, and so I think that admission in her letter gets to that, that sort of question of the, the dignity and the, the silence, the separation of, of many of the black characters in her fiction that socially she was in such a segregated environment that she personally may not have known what to say. 
But she did, as she says in other letters, she did see that the situation was terrible. And she, that's the word she used was terrible uh, to try to describe. Um, she said something like, if it was, it'd be comical if it wasn't such so terrible. I think it was, you know, you know, I mean, she says we can we can try to laugh at this, Marriott, but there's she 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 admitted, I think, that there was something terrible about it. Right. And I want to say what I loved about Carl and Karen, Karen, what you do is you like by having everything voiced, you know, the he says, the she says, the movement, the circulation of voices and circulation in different bodies. Um, I got that, I got it really good in everything the rest of us converge. But watching Karen try to workshop Revelation was a revelation to me because all of a sudden, I think Karen, you said it, it's like this, this whiteness thing is a joke. It's not only just a construction uh, that, we've, that we've, we've gotten the DNA, especially you know, in Flannery's time, but it's almost, you, there's almost a, to see everyone speaking those words, it almost, they lose their power in some ways at the same time that they kind of like explode when you see see when you see it on stage does that make sense when yeah well, the, well it should um we should explain that and and carlton is in this project too we started it at georgetown but um that all the white characters are are played by bpoc you know um actors so um the um and then only Ruby Turpin is played by a white actress. So we really, really, there is agency uh, and you know, right. part of the actors to have an opinion, the theatrical lens that says, really, you know, look <laughs> and, and take ownership of what is being said um, is very exciting. We've only just started the work, but and Carlton, now we've only done, like we did one little reading in December and then one reading in mid-May. But uh, it, it seems we're going down the right road. And then again, with, with everybody as in agreement to be um, a kind of chorus, almost like a cloud, you know, of witnesses, you know, and almost like, you know, it's it moving from like a puck like character from Midsummer Night's Dream to, you know, um, angels and wings of desire. I mean, that sort of thing of, of observation, but from another place that can see the banality and the stupidity of 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 the conversation, of the chat and and the and the assumptions. And she's dismantling that, and that's where I think she's. Pro prophetically moving forward in the work and it's so exciting yeah what i love about um what karen has done in choosing um who says what and how and the characters that um speak um many times um looking looking back at how black people were represented um by during like slavery many times like being furniture in the room like so many times being a witness to what was going on, but not being able to comment to now like um, to having all of those voices and um, characters be like taken on by the observers, like all this time. So it's in a way that you really get to um, lay into these thoughts and ideas like, you know, without um, without any barrier. Like, I don't feel like you can uh, tiptoe coming into it because it's gonna be what it is, like, you know, like straight off the bat. Can I say also that one of the things, you know, for a long time, I've, uh, Harper Lee has driven me crazy because I, I, I really don't like uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. I was in, in Norway a few months ago and I read an article that uh, To Kill a Mockingbird is the most read, the most beloved book in Norway, even more than the Bible. And I thought, you know, one of the, my, my annoyance with Harper Lee is that she really does put, uh, continue this white middle class fantasy that racism comes from the lower class, that it's, it's, it's lower class whites who are, who are causing all of this service. They're the Klansmen and so forth and so on. And the, the, the honorable lawyer who, who saves the day, um, what Flannery O'Connor does in, 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 in some remarkable way is that she breaks through this, this uh, 
uh, class fantasy, and she gives the, the she gives the the her 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 older women, who usually run a, run, run the farm much like her mother does, uh, who are themselves as racist as as and any of the any of the, the poor whites who are working on the property. Uh, the, 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 the end of Revelation, of course, when Mrs. Turpin has to decide <laughs> where she is in the, in the scheme mm -hmm. of things, whether she's black or whether, whether she's white, or not even, even black or white, whether she's poor white or poor black, uh, is, is really, for me, you know, to break through the color, not only color, but the class issues of racism, uh, it's, it seems to me astonishing that she was able to tell us something about the genteel women that her mother would have known that her mother was that that came to the book parties that her mother organized and 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 saw these strange books that that Flannery was producing something in in all of this is really startling for me that here is a woman who was able to describe the 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 the, the, the middle class genteel white as racist yeah. wow and I, I wonder if we can put that observation in relationship to the recent um, accusations of uh, O'Connor's personal cultural racism that came out in The New Yorker. How do we come to terms with uh, what we are describing in her fiction uh, with some of these um, readings of personal letters uh, suggesting that she um, uh, was not progressive, let's say. Well, I mean, Karen and Carlton know this probably much better than I would, but she's very careful in, in most of the stories in, in the way she refers to Blacks, the, the, the author's reference to Blacks. Uh, she will have a character use nigger at, 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 at freely, but she, the, the narrator does not use that word. In the same way she'll use colored or she'll use Black, but she doesn't use the N word. And in that sense, that there, she has control of the language uh, in her stories in a way that she doesn't seem to have control of the language in her letters and her her private correspondence. But th that's only to say that that she might be a, she might be a hypocrite, or that she's using her literature, her art, to essentially educate herself, yeah. moving yeah. herself away from her own the racism of her own of her own society, because there is a progress in these stories. They don't. They they move. They move her along, in in a, in this this the, the woman who has to deliberate whether she, at the end whether she would be poor white or poor black is very different from the net, the Flannery O'Connor who begins this journey. That she's. I think. I think that she herself is is writing this literature in a way to educate herself. You know. I think you're so right, Richard. And I think what it also says is that. She, she truly, if, if, the, if the three, the, the most intimate letters that are, are the most racist, had the most racist language are to her mother. And we only have Flannery O'Connor's letters back. So we don't know what her mother is saying, but it tells me that she grew up totally imbibing that as a child all the way through. If these are the letters she's writing when she's in Iowa to her, to her parents, to her mother, or when she goes to New York for the first time, uh, that these letters, uh, that, that in some ways it was, she had to go on that journey in her art because it was deeply, deeply there. And so for me, um, you know, the, 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 the story of the artificial nigger, this idea of I'm going to educate you in, into racism so you can be a racist, this little boy, right? Um, is in some ways her journey. I mean, she's like, I don't want to be, I don't want anymore. But boy, did she live it, did she breathe it? Uh, yeah. And did she accept it? And I wanna say one thing, I think she accepted it with very few people. I don't, I, I want to do another whole archival research project because I know it's with Betty Hester, who she's very close to. I know it's with Marriott Lee, who it's in a transgressively humoristic way, but there's a lot of truth, you know, just the, the, going through that. And then her mother and, and, and her cousins maybe, but I think it's mostly her mother. And it, it's not to Billy Sessions. It's not to Robert Giroux. It's not to, uh, it's not to Ashley Brown. It's not to all these other people, part of the Southern, uh, kind of a moment of literature. Um, and, and not I don't want to say that, well, that dismisses Flannery O'Connor's racism, but it does say to me that it only happens in that kind of almost familial moment or when she's trying to bear her soul and she can trust that she can say these things as she teases out 
her craft, her art, her vision. Yeah. Uh, because come on, Marriott Lee is in Revelation. I think that's the one of the things that Elizabeth and I really got uh, through uh, through some of the interviews too. Is that she? she I mean, she is. She's responding to Marriott Lee uh, to to Flannery's kind of lethargy around race, uh, and, her, and uh, in many ways. And and let me just add that I think to perceive. O'Connor's racism from an almost naive perspective is to ignore the intelligence that is obvious in her fiction in terms of her ability to write her own kind of character in her stories. The young uh, who comes back with all these PC attitudes can't treat her mother. So I, I have a hard time with the dismissals of O'Connor as a simple-minded um, racist. There was nothing simple-minded about her understanding of racism, personal but, or otherwise. The truth is, uh, we live at a time in which uh, she's, not gonna, she's not gonna make it onto a lot of reading lists, precisely because you can't use that language now in, in, in colleges. Uh, and that's the reason I'm here is just because I, I'm horrified at, at the, the prospect that Flannery O'Connor could be dismissed for being a, a writer who's investigating her own racism uh, in, in these stories uh, and whose, whose journey is primarily not racial or not ethnic, but is religious. She's looking for salvation and, and, and her, her final prayer to God, even as she's dying uh, and she knows that she's dying, is, is laughter um, and that she, she teaches us to pray by laughing, uh, the, to, 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 to dismiss such a writer as racist seems to me to be, to be, to, to disallow a certain bravery of her work, which is to say that she really wants to hear the way her mother speaks. And to, to penalize her for that seems to me to be churlish at the, at the least and damaging to the liter literary freedom. Wow. Well said. You know, I think that one of the things, Richard, that I, I remember somebody once saying to me as I was studying Flannery O'Connor in college, it's like, you know, someone raised their hand in, some, in class and said, well, you know what, um, are her characters good or bad? And, the, and I remember the professor in class saying, she's not really interested in good or bad. Yeah. She's interested in can you, will you be saved? Will you take that journey? Will you do the redemptive act? She doesn't really, I mean, she doesn't really care. Good or bad is, is such a con construction itself. But if salvation, can you be moved, transformed, transfigured, made, granted insight into your own depravity, into your own uh, uh, deep ra racial kinds of configuration? I think that's what she's interested in. Yeah, yeah she's, she's interested in the human heart. She yeah. goes right for the heart and she puts her own heart on the table. You know, so, I mean, it. she called herself sometimes Mrs. Turpin in her letters to Marriott Lee, right? And, um, and in that story, what's so striking to me is that when Ruby Tur Tur Turpin has the third part of the revelation, she sees her virtues are burning mm -hmm. away because, and nobody else's are, only hers, only the white folk that are so full of comfort and certitude and uh, you know, self-righteousness and all this stuff, they are the ones whose virtues are burning. And it's so purgatorial. It's like Dante, it's like Sojourner Truth. She says, I, I can stand the fire. I won't burn, you know? And she says, you all, you will, I will not burn, bring the fire. And, and this is, she can't, you know, she sees that, and for the first time, she says nothing, which is unbelievable because she's so garrulous. And throughout, you know, we can hardly stand whatever she says, it's just egregious. And then at the end, she sees something that is just an encounter, an, a cosmic encounter with the other, the transcendent other, with God. So that's wild. That's one of the last stories. And it's the human heart, yeah. you know, and, and anyway. And even the turn, Carlton, at the end uh, 
of everything that rises must converge, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's a convergence of violence, but then there's that moment, even when Julian, like he finally calls her mommy, ma mother, you know? I mean, all of a sudden your heart just goes like this for everyone in the film. Even though you've been having a good time indicting that person and that person and that person, getting the humor of that indictment of that righteousness, even then you're caught off guard. And it's, it's so power, it's a powerful dramatic moment. I was he thinking, spends all this time trying to teach her a lesson, you know, yeah. and in the end, it's him that learns the most, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. I was thinking of a good, uh, a good man is hard to find. In the recent, the uh, last few days, there was a story, thinking from Florida, of three uh, hunters who were slaughtered by, by some strangers. Um, in in uh, A Good Man is Hard to Find, grandma gets killed at the end. And, and exactly it's what Mark suggests. In the middle of this carnage, this horrible scene of uh, people are being shot in the woods, you know, is the question of, are you saved? You know? <laughs> it's a question of salvation, not the question of violence, but the question of, of salvation and, and the, 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 the relationship of, of uh, grandma to, to, uh, to the misfit and, they're, they're, and the way he finally becomes her judge is really quite astonishing. It's, it's part of the humor of her salvation. Yeah. Uh, Florida, this is my next film. I'm already working on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to add that it, we're not just talking Christian salvation. I mean, let me speak for the secular humanists out there and oh, yeah. uh, uh, Jewish. It's, it's, you know, as Catholic as she was, even Mary Lee said, you could be a Presbyterian <laughs> or you could be a Protestant. Oh, um, absolutely. I think what well, Mary does is she, 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 she tries to attend adequately to the human condition. And that is insight. That's transformation. That's an act of that's an act of redemption to use Flannery's word, you know. Yeah, the, the, do it, please. The, well, the grandmother, the grandmother sees uh, the misfit as her own. Yes, yeah. Yeah. that's the point that that yeah. I see God in you, you know. That that she says, oh, and in that moment she's shot, and then the famous line, you know, she would have been a good woman if she were shot every five minutes of her life, you know. <laughs> she was a grandmother for the first time, reaching out to her really, little bit, yeah. 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 And you those should, are your words, Richard. You should, we use. You should, you should try. You should try. A good man is hard to find in a prison. Uh, like I'd like to see what the prisoners would respond to. <laughs> that would really be wonderful. Oh my god. We have we have a couple of questions and comments over chat. Um, uh, Angela says, "Thank you, Carlton, for your perspective." Was one comment. Um, Laura is asking, "When will we get to see Revelation: The Workshop Resurrected?" Is that going to be available anywhere, Karen? <laughs> well, Revelation, we're, we're just in our beginning stages. So, um, you know, Compania de Colombari, we're, we're gonna, we're talking about uh, doing something in the fall and then the workshop probably next, uh, next spring. So, you know, with the theater, as we all know, everything's on hold a little bit. Uh -huh. <laughs> we're trying to figure out. So this is Laura, who also said, before asking about Revelation, she said uh, Flannery was indiscriminate both in her mordancy, but also in her application of grace. So her nice comment. ability to cut through the BS and, and, and also see transformation. Um, Ginny asked a question, would Flannery have been surprised if she were called racist? Were white people accused of racism during the time she lived? Oh, she she lived during the, the beginning years of the, the great black civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. She would have she would have known that 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 something was coming that was it was changing all around her. Uh, and she I don't know whether she would have felt that she could be accused of racism, but she she I think she began to realize that the kind of freedom that she had to, to was was going to be was going to be tested. Um, in, in some ways, she dies just exactly at the moment in which she should die. Uh, that she's achieved her vision, and she's she's uh, come to terms with with her body and her soul. Uh, but but America was roiling all around her, and suddenly the South was filled with outsiders, and her 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 objection to Eudora Welty's uh, piece in the New Yorker. Where she takes the she she impersonates 
the Klansman who has killed uh, um, Medgar Evers, yeah. her, her annoyance at that, and that it's plain to a white liberal New York audience. That's, that's Southern talk. Mm -hmm. And it's the talk that one heard in the 60s. You know, outsiders coming to, to, to help in voter registration and so forth. Um, and let us figure this out. You don't have to come in and help us. She knew that, that, that she must have known that that was going to test her or come to an end. It's an un un ungenerous moment when she criticizes Eudora Welty for that remarkable impersonation. Yeah, I was, I was at a couple of webinars recently. Oh, another one with Angelo O'Donnell, uh, who was just uh, was thanking Carlton uh, back then. Um, but I, we, there were a lot of chats about people who grew up in Milledgeville. And, and, uh, and, and I was reading some of those. Milledgeville was, a, was, was someone said, it was, it was like the center of kind of a racial kind of um, uh, romance, romanticism of uh, that there's a there's segregation of the races. And, and it was a very, very unique place. Um, but at the same time, I know two people who live there and said that if we had ever used the N word, our parents would have, you know, knocked us into the next county. Uh, that uh, we wouldn't, we would not do this. And so even in as in the fifties and sixties, I think that O'Connor, um, you know, leaves, comes back, lives on a farm, lives kind of a, even enclosed within another enclosure than Milledgeville. Uh, and I do think that in many ways she was getting, she was getting what was going on. But that she grew up in a, at least in a household that that was a lot, that word was allowed. And that word was kind of a, a, a kind of a code word for kind of an intimacy. I think that that would have dropped if she could have lived on. I think that that would have dropped. I just see that trajectory of her, of her art and her friendships not allowing that. Yeah. The, the advantage that someone like Eudora Welty had is that Eudora went to finish her, her college years in Wisconsin. And then went to business school in, at Columbia University in New York. She she worked in New York. She already she knew the she knew the northern world in a way that Eudora simply never really had a chance to do. She was she was forced back to the south in many ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a there's an interesting question. It's a little bit um, it's a little bit of a tangent, but I, I'd love to, I, I would love to hear it. Uh, it's to Richard from Andrew. Um, did you see that? It just says. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, in much of your work, you've examined Catholicism in America and have dedicated one of your works to the Irish sisters who taught you. Does reading Flannery ever remind you of these nuns? <laughs> and could you speak more generally about how the interest in this Catholic vision of America? Well, that, that's a very interesting question because in, in some way that was her outsider status, that she was a Catholic in a Protestant culture. Yeah. And, that, and that, 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 that wonderful story uh, of the Temples of the Holy Ghost, um, where she's, where the, where the, the narrator is, is embraced by this nun who takes <laughs> within her robe and, and, she, and her face is forced against the crucifix. I was, I was educated by the same Sisters of Mercy that educated Flannery O'Connor. Um, and I feel that same, uh, both the, the Irish severity of the order, uh, but also their sense that we belong to a society that was quite different from American Protestantism. And that uh, it, we had our own we had our own ceremonies, we had our own sense of holiness, of redemption, and Flannery. I, it seems to me, at crucial moments, becomes the Catholic again. And 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 although so much of her fiction is encompassed by the Protestant world, and by the low church Protestant circus tent Protestantism, nonetheless, you know, with a story like the Temples of the Holy Ghost, she really does get to this vision of herself as a Catholic in a Protestant society. That's a theme that is not widely discussed by many Catholic writers, but yeah. she discusses it. Yeah, yeah, true. We only have a few more minutes, and so I just want to go turn right back to the film here, if we can. Or Elizabeth, did you want to respond to, to Richard? I'm sorry. Well, I'm just going to add that, Richard, great comment. And next Monday, we're going to have another one of these discussions just on uh, Flannery O'Connor's uh, life and writing and faith. So we'll come back to these questions next. Yes, go ahead, Mark. So I was just wondering, I mean, so I, Elizabeth, uh, watching Elizabeth really kind of uh, help put this together, because I, again, I, 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 I had to take my hats off to, to her, her, her talent as a documentarian. Um, but we really did try to kind of, we tried to, do, to make alive 
that moment of, uh, of civil rights, that moment of change in the film. Uh, we tried to do it through archival footage that, that uh, Elizabeth and our team put together alongside the letters of Flannery Goddard and alongside actually comments from Karen Coonrod about you know, Gone with the Wind and Richard Rodriguez about the, the ear, the voice, uh, and even the, how in many ways uh, she's too good a mimic. So I just was wondering if you, if you could, is there any way for you to, what, as a last comment about just on the film, what do you think about uh, uh, that, that dialectical relationship between uh, seeing the visions and the voices of the South and Flannery O'Connor? Did it work to kind of, I guess what I'm asking is, do, uh, do we do our job? Do we contextualize Flannery O'Connor and race to your estimation? Or are, are, are we missing something? I, I guess I really want to ask that because we tried our best to give the, the, the breadth and the width of, of many voices in that. I thought it was a wonderful film. I, I say this, I say this both as somebody who's in it, but as, but as somebody who's watched your progress, the, the version I I saw several months ago is this version is just a, is, is 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 a dazzler, um, and um, my sense is that the relationships that she, for example, the lesbian moment in that in that correspondence when she accepts her friend as for what she is. That's a Plenary O'Connor growing cosmopolitan and growing, growing generous in a way that's that's quite surprising. But this there is clearly a life growing in this. This is not a woman who starts out being Plenary O'Connor. This is a woman who becomes Plenary O'Connor. She even changes her name in the course of, of her of her of her life. This is a woman who who finds within her own fiction, her own her own sense of herself, who who instructs herself. By, the, by her, her writing. And that I think you've caught in the documentary, that this is a woman in, in process, uh, in progress, Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, cool. Karen? With, well, with also the, the, the music that really builds, you know, and keeps a rhythm going. There's a rhythm in this film that is just wonderful with, with also the little, the, the, the Harvey Bright, the, interview you know, which you know, speak so well but that Harvey Bright interview that you see right at the beginning and you know with him with his cigarette and <laughs> I remember seeing that in the archives 1955 <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> unbelievable right and and then you see it and you see this fierce and shy uh writer you know who is talking about mystery yeah. And I, I love the way you you go back to that. But she, as Richard has just said, it's she really is a person who was growing. And yeah. and somebody recently, the, the last week's New Yorker um, letter to the editor said she said she died too soon. You know, she just I mean, she died in the time that she was taken. But, you know, it she was really growing and she was reaching for something beyond what she knew. Mm -hmm. And that is a prophetic writer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a couple of people are asking on chat about the New Yorker article, I think from the week before uh, by Paul Eli and, and, and how we think the film responds to that. And I think Mark just brought up the archival footage that um, I, I personally spent a lot of time finding and we had some great researchers uh, who also found, uh, you know, investigative footage from CBS of the Klan, uh, WNET in New York had done some, have cap captured this great documentary of um, white racists with a Confederate flag in the background. And so we, we put that archival footage in to, to really paint a portrait of the context in which she was living and writing. And this is what she was hearing. She was hearing the N-word. She was hearing white, white nationalists talk about how they couldn't stand Catholics, Jews, or N-word, right? It's, um, that's, that's what she was writing in. And that's what she lived through and how she personally responded to that I mean, the evidence we take in the film is is from her writing. And and I think the intelligence of that writing in terms of how she approached both her own feelings about and social discomfort with uh, racial difference um, is really all the proof that um, I need 
uh, to understand her her temperament. So I we hope the archival footage helps to set that up and the animation. Carlton, uh, do you want to any 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 thoughts just about uh, uh, what we were talking about? Just that, you know, trying to contextualize what contextualize what a historical moment is with Ray uh, in terms of racism uh, in the 1950s and 60s uh, with uh, this contemporary moment. Um, uh, I, it, it seems to me that when we started this film two years before Black Lives Matter, right, 2015, and uh, Elizabeth and I were, were very, just a very much aware how we, this is going to be a larger terrain. I, at least I thought we had to map this out a lot more. I was just wondering, uh, your, your experience of Bonnie O'Connor, your experience of working on her stuff, but or your experience of the film, what you might have to offer? Um, I'm sorry, I'm, can, can you ask the question in another way? Sure, sure. I, I, there's a lot of stuff just to throw you, I apologize. Yeah, right. Uh, basically, I, I was not sure, in terms of, the, in terms of, of what Flannery O'Connor could mean to us today in terms of what's going on in the streets and in terms of police oh, brutality. I feel like, I feel like, I feel like um, a lot of the conversations that have been going on right now have been about removing the mask and the stuff that we have to deal with. Um, and I feel like, you know, um, the things that I've appreciated about her work is um, the fact that it gets right, right to it. Like mm -hmm. immediately, like, you know, from the first line, it's almost like, a gun's gone off, and you're um, we're racing to um, to 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 the to the rising action, you know, or like you know, just waiting for that thing to happen. And I feel like that is for the time right now. The mask is off. The time is um, for us now to look at these things that have kind of like always been, and like where do we where, where and to make the decision, like you know, to look at ourselves. Wow where do we fit in the lineup? Like, you know, like what part of this is our burden and to like, to struggle with it, you know, and to, and to ultimately like fight for, for, for what is better. I feel like, you know, through her writing, you know, and even like, you know, as she felt her own mortality, I felt like she was always fighting to, to be better, to understand, to, 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 um, to, to make sense of all these things, to like, you know, like I feel like in her heart there was love and you can see it in the characters and just trying to match um, what she felt in her heart place to what she was experiencing. And that's, um, that's, that, that's what's coming up for me, you know, right now constantly just even having to hold space for a lot of these conversations. It can be, um, it can be overwhelming, but empowering of like, now is the time to say something. So war with it now, because we don't have tomorrow. Um, maybe we should let um, one of our listeners uh, have one of the comments. Uh, Mary Kambik wrote on Facebook. She said, as a white woman who loves O'Connor and has been involved in civil rights struggles, I have a vision of O'Connor who trained her chicken to walk backwards, meeting John Lewis who baptized his chickens in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Yeah, I think I think heaven is exactly the right place. Yeah. I, you know, uh, I think it, uh, finally, I say this as a Catholic, but I think uh, it is it is to uh, the Saint Flannery that I pray at night. <laughs> I'm, with, I'm with you, Richard. I have to admit. Well, listen, let, we have to get going, but I really appreciate uh, you all being with us today. Um, I'm hoping that all of our. I'm hoping that everybody uh, uh, watching. Uh, has really uh, enjoyed and, and, and got to know uh, Richard and Karen and Carlton, Elizabeth, and myself. Uh, we hope you see the film if you haven't yet. And we will be back next week to kind of uh, segue into Bonnie O'Connor and this inner question of her faith and, and how that kind of uh, is positioned both in her life, in the movie, and how we might uh, talk about it today. So Karen, Carlton, uh, Richard, Elizabeth, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks. We really appreciate it. <laughs> Ciao.